Good afternoon, good evening. Again, my name's Jason, and I'm very excited today to have some good friends of mine, Ian Roy and Frank. And uh, again, these guys have uh, extensive quality regulatory backgrounds, um, as well as some other colorful backgrounds that we won't go into today. But uh, what we're gonna cover, uh, we're gonna ask Roy and Frank to go into more background on their, their um, journey of how did they come to where they are today, especially in validation and CSA in that space. We'll get into a little bit of why CSA, right? Before we can get into the tools, we all always have to start with uh, CSA as a baseline and what is the methodology that transformation look like. Uh, then we'll jump into a little bit of the tool and talk about why Polarian, uh, which is a best in class AL ALM solution from Siemens and what compliance group has done is created a, a CSA risk management template on top of it. Uh, and then Frank and Roy will go into uh, their advice, their lessons learned uh, on the journey they've had, both around the methodology as well as technology, the culture, and so on. And so with that, uh, let's dive into a little bit more of Roy and Frank's background. So look, everybody has a story of how they've gotten to where they are in the validation space. And maybe we can start with uh, Roy, hearing a little bit of your background and how did you get to where you are today? Sure, um, thanks Jason. So um, how did I get to where I am today? Um, I started out uh, early in my career, actually I studied genetic engineering before I went into information systems. So I was at Carnegie Mellon studying genetics and I worked in a genetics lab for a couple of years and realized I didn't wanna do somebody else's research for the next 20 years. So I switched over and did IT consulting. I then joined Merck um, as a development architect uh, responsible for remote data capture across the world of all the clinical data systems and pieces, um, and started running into lots of arguments with our validation and quality teams. Um, and I was talking about, hey, how do we do this? Why do we have to redo the testing here? Why do we have a piece of it? So I learned the, um, all the international regulations very well and started being able to have cogent arguments with them about how to do it and how not to do it. And then went and started joining the um, DIA conferences and talking to the people from the agencies and talking to the people from the FDA, learning about why they did it versus what's written in the documents. And through that time of all of it, I worked in the entire uh, uh, data life cycle of information throughout its entire life cycle from basic research all the way to post-marketing surveillance. And after all that and developing that, I found that being able to empower others to develop systems more effectively and actually use the, uh, the regulatory compliance as an advantage versus a liability, I had more impact than just developing systems myself. So through consulting other piece of it, I moved throughout the environment. Now I'm responsible as a global process owner for computer system validation at BD. And we're moving on uh, to, I think, better and bigger, bigger and better things as a company by embracing the, the, the risk-based approach to validation and compliance that have been there in the regulations for decades, but people were afraid to do it. So now we're actually trying to fulfill that, that need as a piece of it. So yep. that's a 10 cent tour for me. So, <laughs> Thanks, Roy. And I, I should add that early in my career, uh, back when I was in uh, starting out as a quality engineer at Johnson & Johnson, I remember Roy going to a seminar you were speaking at in New Jersey uh, back in the day as a thought leader on validation. So it's, it's nice I'm old, circle, right, to come yeah. around. Uh, so great. So let's uh, transition over to Frank. And you know, Frank, you've got uh, you know more of a, a story you want to tell as well of your your experience with CSA. But uh, yes, yeah, sure. why don't you give us a little bit of your journey and background as well? Okay. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah. So everybody, my my entrance into this space did not come through, uh, you know. The traditional I started and went into computer system validation and got lots of experience so mine's more of a story of about five years ago on how CSA sort of fell into my lap and the things that I did in order to make my life easier um, so maybe some of you can relate to this uh, you know as as companies moving into the space trying to validate systems and getting into how much work the validation can actually be and then to realize that there are ways out there to do it in uh, you know much more efficient ways so about five years ago I was the production quality manager for a class 3 medical device at uh, Zoll Life Vest and our company at the time was making that transition from a paper-based DHR process to using Camstar our MES system 
right? So being new to the world of non-product software validation, our approach was on the extreme conservative approach using heavily scripted process validations created by consultants, right? Because, you know, we didn't know what we were doing, bring on the consultants who are paid by the hour, right? So they want to make long scripts that we have to run. So at this point, I was watching for days as our regulatory team spent hours in conference rooms, right? So maybe this is where some of you can relate, uh, you know, creating boxes and boxes of paperwork. Um, and it got overwhelming that they started using my team at the quality team to do the double checking of the test scripts, not for the proper testing, but for signatures, date stamps, screenshots, right? All the stuff that goes into the test script that's, you know, really non-value added at that point. Um, so it pushed out months past our original go live date. And, you know, we did go live eventually, right? Um, everyone was excited. You know, I still wasn't involved yet, but uh, we may or may not even have had a cake party, you know, yay, the system's live. But um, then came the changes, right? So with the validated system, uh, now we have all the small workflow changes that needed to be integrated into the workflow, right? Simple, change control. Um, but the team continued to rely on heavily scripted tests for even the changes. So it was at this point, um, they handed the CSV efforts over to my team and I really started to get involved and there was over 90 workflow system changes. Uh, they were outpacing our ability to do the changes. Um, it was an endless validation loop from initial validation through each workflow change. That's why you just see the person with the picture with paper everywhere, right? Maybe people can relate to that. Or the time loop, right? It just seemed like time was never ending. If there were people on this call that were a part of my team back then, they would know exactly what we were talking about, right? People literally started to hate they hated our CSV team. Uh, we were being blamed for all these extended timelines because they didn't understand. They saw the brand new system. Why couldn't we use this? You know, why do we have to keep making these changes? There were these fears about, you know, you have to heavily script everything. At this time, you know, I literally was con uh, considering a job change. As much as I loved working in quality and regulatory, this, uh, the CSV nonsense was, was not for me. Thank, luckily at this point, Q and Jason, on this call and Cisco Vicente from the FDA, they were talking about this possibility to do risk-based testing for systems requirements that would allow for unscripted ad hoc testing, right? What are these new words that, that are not scripted testing? Um, you know, my director at the time, he wasn't so sure about a change like this as he was heavily committed to the conservative scripted testing approach, right? Me, I was ready to quit. So I was hanging on every word that Jason and Cisco spoke at the time. I couldn't raise my hand fast enough to jump right in and pilot any approach that they could come up with us together with the FDA. So I got to go ahead to try a big eye roll from the leadership team on my part. For me, that's all I needed to go though. So with this safe space to work with the FDA, we developed a risk-based approach to, to CSV and computer system assurance. And we were able to develop, to develop a system that our company leadership was comfortable with. We now had a simplified process that took into consideration the risk level of the requirement, the system configuration level, and even the risk level at our vendors on the specific vendor criteria. And as Roy, Roy on this call also likes to talk about, you know, this paradigm shift is nothing new to the industry. However, getting people to follow the true spirit of the approach is what got lost in translation over the many years. So this shift in thinking is nothing new. It's just a shift in culture, a shift in mindset. In summary, once we adopted this risk-based approach to CSV, we took our backlog from 90 changes down to zero, right? Changes went from around 30 labor hours on average down to 11. The changes were no longer outpacing our ability to integrate and validate the changes while adding zero headcount to our team. After a year, we literally had over 900 changes. These were small workflow changes, but changes that needed to be validated. Um, the business was happy again. I was happy at my job, right? The process was more efficient and effective. It was also paper-based, which still presented several different challenges, but that's where we're going to talk about playing in the next part of this presentation. But that's the summary of my story. So I was sort of thrown into the fire. Um, I got involved with Jason, and that brings me to this point here where I can talk about how my 
teams went about creating this risk-based approach, but that you can do it and it is possible. So with that, uh, we'll get more on to hear about what Roy did with BD, but that's my story and entrance into CSV. Yeah, Frank, I love it. I mean, especially, you know, sales operations, production into quality, right? And you've got this uh, situation where CSV is a four letter word and, you know, and, and then you start the transformation, right? You hear uh, about CSA from the Fixa team and the oh. work with Cisco at FDA and so on. And what I, what I love about the story, if I could just for a minute brag on you a little bit, right, is, and I'm, I'm looking at the slide right now. I mean, I remember the story and just the courage you had, the leadership. So many companies today are struggling with taking the risk, I, even though there's very little risk in my mind, right? But they're yeah. struggling yeah. with, just starting right and going after this and you guys jumped in and actually you became the the model the poster child if you will for the value that csa can drive and i love these metrics that you had shared again this is going back a few years ago but just the speed and the agility of how csa i mean the 95 percent reduction in csv turnaround i mean uh, you know, again, Roy's going to get into the value here in a little bit from perspective of BD with the methodology, but, you know, yeah. this is so important for anyone that's going down a digital transformation journey, right, is to have this method methodology so that you have the speed, the agility, you can respond, you can be responsive, right, uh, yeah. when you need to do upgrades, bug fixes, things happening in the field, right, so you know, anyway, there's there's a lot. And then what was so cool is you wound up being invited by the FDA to actually speak at a public meeting, an FDA public meeting, right, about the experience. So uh, anyway, yeah. I love, love this and stuff. The so. key is, is that that you you all with the compliance group as well, you know how to do this now, right? We developed this years ago. Again, it's nothing new, but we've done it so many times, or you all have done it so many times that the, the help is there. It's a lot easier to access that help now. Um, hopefully, a lot more of the mindset has shifted. So, if you're if you have any worries or you're you're thinking about it, just ask. Ask the question. Reach out to Jason or Roy or myself. Um, we're here to help. So, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely, it's great. All right, which is a great lead into again, why? Right? Why would we adopt this methodology? And I mean, there's a lot of um, going to poke fun at some of the folks out there that just, for whatever reason, haven't gotten on board with this, right? Maybe they love screenshots and the more the better, or they think that filing cabinets full of documents is what the FDA wants to see. And I can tell you some stories that that is not the case. Or, you know, maybe they just enjoy redoing the vendor testing that's already been done, right? So, I don't know, just real quick before I, I transition Roy into the value, any any quick comments from you or, or Frank on Well, I, on think, that? I think you've, you've sort of hit on a little bit, but fundamentally the, the industry in a lot of cases, especially a lot of the validation consulting teams, and I don't mean to speak ill of consultants because I was one for a long time, um, they get paid by the effort they put in or the hours they work, right? So fear sells. The idea that you can um, say, oh no, if you don't validate this, the world's gonna end and the piece of it translates to, used to translate to, okay, so make reams and reams of documents of, of uh, evidence and lots and lots of scripts versus really looking at and using some critical thinking and looking at why are we testing what we're testing? How do we do it? And how do we actually prove that it works? Not, did we check the boxes? I think the one, uh, comment that Frank made as piece of it is that people are spending more time making sure that people put NA in each one of the fields on a paper document than they are about whether the system works or not, right? Um, one of my favorites of that is if it's an electronic document, why are you putting NA in the, in the, in the field? The only reason you have it there is from back in the day when we all, because I was a um, lab scientist as well. When you're doing your lab notebook, you have to write initial and date it and drawing it through that somebody didn't add it. So if I have a digital record of that document, I know when the person added it, if they added additional information, that little extra NA with my initials on each one of those fields isn't adding any value if it's electronic. And yet we spend more time worrying about that than we did about why we actually tested what we designed. So you can have a 400 pages of screenshots that re replicate what's going on, which is incredibly error prone, but never really get to the root cause of what the issue is you're trying to test. 
So I think one of the issues is that we've said, a lot of times it happened is, you know, don't think, just do was sort of the model with a lot of the, the, the scripted testing. They wanted to say anybody can come off the street and test a system without understanding how it works based on the script. Well, all that means is you're only going to catch stuff that you were smart enough to figure out the logic of your script in the first place. Okay. And if you don't understand the algorithm you're testing, you're not going to write the script to catch what was wrong. So that's why investing some time in the analysis up front and using smarter testing versus more testing is the approach that everybody was looking for. And that's where the, the if you use the CSA correctly, that's where you're looking at. You look at critical thinking, you look at why you're testing what you're testing, and then only test the stuff that's important and not just redo the same stuff. Like I can put a mountain of paper that shows I retested the same transaction to say that my um, uh, you know, my um, calendar widget worked the same way on 500 screens. Guess what? It's a reusable object. Testing it 500 times adds zero value. But I can create the forms and fill it out that way. I can spend weeks and weeks signing and dating every single one of those forms, or I can write one script that actually tests it accurately, defines it, and explains why. That's, yeah. I think, the biggest issue that's been missed piece of it. So, yeah. Roy, let me add, one, one of the craziest things I ever heard, too, going through this process was uh, I think the system made a sound, right? And it wasn't enough for the person to sign and date that they heard the sound. They thought they needed to actually take a video of the sound happening to prove that the sound happened. So, right, if you can't trust the person signing and dating that they heard a sound and that now you have to take a video of the sound, that's the level that some consultants were taking this to, that some uh, some places were in fear of, they're, they're not gonna sh be able to show that right. this really happened, right? So a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, somebody that understands just the surface level of something will say, oh, I need evidence of everything at the same level, okay? One of the issues, example, prime example of that. Um, if I have a thermostat that's controlling the, the temperature in a room, um, whether I've tested whether that thermostat uses a um, uh, electrical impedance that can cause a spark is irrelevant if I'm using that in a office setting. It doesn't matter if it's gonna do a little spark in there if it's, it's sitting in an office where we are. However, if it's in a clean room or in a manufacturing site that has a lot of particulate in it, it can blow up the building. Understanding the intended use, understanding why you're doing it is more important than did I just check the box. Yep. Right? So I had an auditor one time many moons ago, thank God, that came in and said, why didn't you validate the electrical outlet for the server that's plugged in in the, in the office? And I'm like, you're crazy, right? There's zero value in that. The 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 UPS that it's connected to um, uh, basically filters out any of the uh, line noise anyways, and there's no impact for that. Well, it says everything has to be I'm like understand why the regulation is written. Don't just read the actual text. Go back, and that's why I was saying what I said before. Risk-based approach is nothing new. We make yeah. a risk-based approach every day we walk out the door. The issue is we don't document what the risk is. Okay, and risk risk acceptance, risk avoidance, risk management is a great thing. Risk ignorance is not. And that's where the problem is. If you don't think about what's going on or why you're doing it, you're just adding more administrative overhead to cover up the fact that you didn't do the analysis to figure it out first. So again, from my perspective and from BD's perspective, it's applying the right logic to what you're testing, not necessarily just wallpapering it with paper to make sure they don't find it. I mean, yep. that's, I think, the primary piece. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I think you just named the next webinar risk ignorance, so we'll come back to that. No, but um, uh, no, I mean just to to make one quick point, and then I'll I'll move into the next uh, slide, uh, Roy. But I mean, I think you guys both hit on it, right? I mean, this is this is about putting the time up front to think through critically what am I trying to do and what does the risk look like, and if you put that time up front you're going to get significantly more value on the back end, right? As, as Roy said, smarter testing, better testing, but a fraction of the documentation, you're not going to trip over yourself. That's the thing, right? With those filing cabinets, I mean, all the deviations and nonconformances that have nothing to do with the actual software itself, right? You can avoid a lot of this by upfront putting the time in uh, to think, critically about what you're trying to do in the requirements. And I know both of you uh, have more to add to that here as we go through. Um, but, you know, Roy, I love 
um, I love the story of what you're doing at BD around the transformation, the value creation, the use cases. Uh, I think some of these are very unique. Uh, would you mind walking us sure. through again, back to that question, yep. why CSA, right? The value piece. To this? Right, so this is coupled with, uh, we're, we're going for um, a harmonized risk-based approach for the company following a CSA model and just the harmonization of different standards and procedures. Um, a lot, like, like a lot of companies, our company has grown through a lot of inorganic growth over time. We've acquired different companies, but, and we're, we're in a, a multi-year program to sort of harmonize that and inspire quality as, as one, uh, one organization, one vision, one voice in the company. You go from like 126 different quality systems down to, down to less than 20, nine different policies and over 65 different procedures on how to validate software down to one policy and four procedures. That's the basic gist of it, right? And in that, we look at reducing the amount of burden of that documentation requirements. This, the old standards across the board averaged about 19 different uh, SDLC or software development lifecycle deliverables per system change, right? We now harmonized it, okay, all of the same standard, and we actually then categorize it based on the risk approach associated with it, talking about the impact of the system, whether in its complexity. And for a simple system, we went from 19 documents to two, and from a medium system, we're at four. And even for a larger scale system, we're down, reduce the number of documentation down to only seven for a given system if you're deploying it. Now, that doesn't mean we got away with all the, get rid of all the testing. What it meant is we focused on doing the stuff that's actually of uh, impact and of import to the organization. An example of a simple system, the piece of it would be a, an Excel spreadsheet you're using for quality release of products, right? So first of all, you don't validate Excel, it's a utility. Then what you do is you actually look at the logic behind it and you write exactly how it works, how you tested it, what evidence you used, and then sign off on it. That's it from a, from a simple system perspective. Large scale systems actually have more deliverable, obviously from requirement specs and designs, another piece of it. But I think, and I'll pick up on one of the questions that popped up in the chat as well. Same concept for a cloud-based solution, right? You have a platform and you're gonna leverage that vendor's uh, documentation of all the things they built in you obviously have to assess that vendor, verify that their internal quality is correct, they have a piece of it, and they manage their releases. And then you do the Delta comparison for their releases. If you deploy a system every, if they make updates every year, you hold off for an deployment, you verify that you've done their, their, um, their release notes, you verify the impact of the system of it, and then you see what is impact. If it doesn't impact any of your systems, you leverage their documentation. If it does, you do a regression test based on what you did, what it changed, what that impact is. That impact analysis is more important and better than redoing all the testing. Mm -hmm. So that's the approach we're taking. So what it basically focuses again is on looking at how complex is the change, how much effect does it have on either the uh, business continuity or regulatory risk, or to how it, and then more importantly, most importantly, is patient safety and, and product quality. If it doesn't impact any of those three, or it's low on it, all of them, we consider that negligible, which means we leverage the vendor documentation and we don't test it. If it's higher, we do a higher level of risk associated with it. As we've done that, and go ahead and you can switch the uh, slide if you want to. As we've done that, we've seen a significant value opportunity here and actually doing a um, smarter set of, of work versus less. Just from um, reducing the amount of documentation, that we've looked at about um, a little over a 50% reduction in the overall documentation burden of all these systems. Not everything is a simple system, right? But even the large scale systems have left documentation. And we're focusing on the work on the more value added activities piece of it. Because we're investing the time to actually do a functional risk assessment of the, of the requirements up front, we're also looking at around an average of about 40% reduction in the overall testing. Now, I want to be clear on something, if we could. Go, go ahead and pop the next example of up. This doesn't mean we do, we stop testing or we do less testing. What we do is we do smarter testing, more effective testing. So we're going to actually have, and we have seen in some of these tests uh, that we have um, more errors found in testing, which is actually a good thing. Right? But we'll talk about that in a bit, uh, more in a minute. So one of the examples that we have is, you know, as I said, integrated growth. You know, we, we have mergers and acquisitions that occur. Companies grow by uh, uh, acquiring new companies. When you're acquiring a new company, you also acquire their assets, their capabilities, and their liabilities. If you have a set of new applications that come in, you have to assess them, identify what to do with them, and, and get them ready so that you can then stand up behind an uh, audit if it comes in the future. That's a large burden for any company. And it was an onerous burden when you look at the old process of, of the sort of the legacy or archaic set of documentation required. So we reduced that in piece of it, and just in one of the one of the acquisitions alone, we were able to reduce about three man years worth of just document review associated with the different systems associated. Okay. 
but that's a huge win for for um, the organization. And frankly, it's, it allows my team to actually get real work done versus going through administrative overhead all the time. Okay, next next example. Yeah. And and I, I just got a comment because I, I absolutely love this example because there's so much M&A going on, especially for the larger um, uh, manufacturers. I mean, this is a great example of, you know, how CSA can provide value around the M&A. And anytime you can measure savings in man years, that's, that's pretty good, so. Um, we also look at, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a one size fits all, they're, they're tailored down to it. And basically we integrated a, um, a local uh, requirement in with a, one of our um, ERP systems and we reduced the, the effort uh, by about a little over half um, associated with the amount of uh, review. And we also reduced the overall projection that the testing is around a 40% reduction in testing. Again, it's testing on the, the high risk functions and the pieces there and decreasing the amount of uh, testing on the, the low risk components. I was mentioning in the piece of it that it, it reduced, it actually increases the number of tests uh, 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 that were failed because they're actually getting to the actual functional requirements. Not it, So it decreases the script errors based on the script being wrong and the documentation being done by around 60 to 70% on some of the examples we have, but it increases the errors we find that are real also by about 20%, which is a good thing. Because if you test it first and you find it in testing, it's a heck of a lot better than finding it after the fact and you get critical change what's in in production. Because people have time to focus on what the real world activity is and what the user acceptance is versus did I fill out the 75 different steps correctly or because a lot of script errors you find, especially when they're very prescriptive in the script, is the person said click on enter and the actual uh, uh, the, the value is is um, you know next. The, the the button was a piece of it. Those don't add any value. They actually slow the process down. They get people confused on what the document is, and this is where a lot of that uh, that that testing um, and C, uh, CSV. Um, burden and um, uh, feeling of like pain comes from is they're they're stuck they were everybody was stuck in doing the are you serious I have to write down what I put on 15 fields on a form and it's the same 15 fields and I have to do it like 14 script wise you don't if you look at the design correctly and write the uh, the uh, testing appropriately you can focus on what it really is and then what the outcome is not just did I click on on the 53 fields on the screen at the same time okay go ahead yeah Next. And I, I mean, just a quick comment on what you just went through. It was awesome, right? I mean, I remember, uh, you know, Frank, when 2016, 2017, when we were trying to message, right, the FDA industry CSA team on, you know, why is CSA so important, right? I mean, it, you know, it, you want to be careful, right? Because what we're trying to message is we're reducing the documentation burden. But in fact, we may be increasing the testing and the quality right of the testing and yeah we always use that slide that showed you know 80 percent testing or 80 percent documentation 20 percent testing flip the script right make it 80 percent testing 20 percent documentation right and and i think really the example you just gave i mean that that is exactly what we were looking for right it's i don't i don't want to get tripped up with test script errors what i want to find are real software issues right and that's mm -hmm. That's what you just talked to, which was fantastic. And, and I mean, the, these are just examples. We've had a piece of it, and they're, they're, they're um, this is the ability to actually look at, you focus the testing based on the nature of the design. And these are just sort of, sort of the like the test cases we've used for our pilot projects as we go along. We're still gonna evolve this. We have a lot more to learn as an organization. We're gonna get better at it as we go, but that's a piece of it. Um, real fast before we jump, I just noticed a question that popped in here as well. Uh, and I may, this may be a little heresy, but um, uh, how would you differentiate CSA versus risk-based approach in CSV in GAMP? Uh, new flavor of the day to talk about it? The reality is that risk-based approaches have been around since at least 2002. And like I said before, we've been doing it forever. It just hasn't been adopted that way. So I think what's happening, and I've seen from what's pushing from the FDA piece of it is they're like no we were serious use your brains and actually do risk-based approach we said it before people didn't get it so we now label it something else in some way as a from my software background it's sort of the idea of what's agile agile is basically joint application development that used to be called rapid application development that used to be called rapid prototyping we changed the names of terms to to sell more consulting and protect the guilty it's the same concept 
it's logically the same approach. It's just formed with a better framework and a better way for people to document it and everybody to absorb it and adopt it together. But CSA is not fundamentally different than a risk-based approach that was based on the old systems. It's just a new way of new terminology to use to make it easier for everybody to use. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. And if our good friend Cisco Vicente from FDA were on right now, he would say exactly what Roy just said. This is not new. And in fact, I think some would argue, do we even need a guidance? But the, the reality is, for whatever reason, you know, fear, well, misperceptions, bad, ex whatever, manufacturers have not been doing this, right? So right. that is why the guidance has been drafted and why we've been pushing this so hard, um, like Roy said. The, the fact we that we're really still- need it folks were doing it, right? The, so the fact that we're still pushing a rock up a hill 20 years after it came out means we needed a new guidance. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, so a lot, again, love those use cases, Frank, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Roy, Roy, thank you for sharing. Um, let's transition now into a little bit of the technology, right? And again, talk about, you know, why leverage Polarian CSA and the risk management capabilities. Um, and again, just to poke a little fun, uh, again, there are folks out there that are just, no, 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 I, I like Excel, I like Word. Let me keep manually tracing my risk to my requirements and testing, or I enjoy the fact that I've got my risk being handled outside of a, a, you know another another system. Um, and then you know unscripted testing, right? We'll talk more about that. But you know, I, I mean, some folks are still struggling. What is unscripted testing? And then, oh wait, you want to put it into a technology now, like Clarion? You just blew me. You know, now you blew my mind. I'm really confused now on how to do this. So. Um, maybe we can dive in and, and um, Frank, uh, you can walk us through a little bit of your thoughts on this and, and then Roy, please, please feel free to add. Yeah, and just to touch base here again, you know, as I'm joining BD, I, I've only been with BD for a couple months now, but I've done a lot of this CSA, you know, in the past and I'm, I'm working a lot more with Roy um, in the future. But what I've done with Polarian in the past was really get to play with the technology and understand, again, we had 900 changes. That wasn't a lie over a year, right? So where were all these changes? They were all paper scanned in. They were in just file folders, and that was just what our company used. So when I learned there was this tool, Polarian, right, you know, what are what are some of the things this system can do? I was like, let me play with it, please. Let me see what's going on, right? So. I used our example to put a business case together for Polarian. And, and one of the things I wanted to point out to our leadership, um, you know, where these pain points were, right? And just to highlight a few um, with the test script relationships, even with the risk-based approach, it was very manual and still quite error prone. So with Polarian workflow approvals, right? And signatures are built into the system, which were fantastic and can be automated, right? And that's creating that digital thread in the system that can easily compare and provide a summary of relationships to the user. To me, this is one of the most beautiful things that Polarian was able to do for me, having so many software system validations and changes to manage, to be able and find them quickly, to do regression analysis quickly. Um, rather than just having to, you know, search or keep a file index in Excel, right? Um, and another one of the pain points that we dealt with was having to look up previous test scripts to run them maybe a second or third time. A lot of our workflow changes were small, so they were very similar to things we did in the past. Um, and we would have to remember, well, what was that number? Oh, yeah, 233. That was the one we keep reusing again, right? When all these are in Polarian, you can find them quickly and you can just reuse it. It is beautiful. Um, it keeps things organized if you're a person like that. Um, and that's where I saw a lot of the labor hours time spent significantly reduced. So like, how are you reducing these labor hours? It's by small things like this that add up and a system to make things, you know, so compact and all in one spot. Um, and that was really one of the, the technology issues and, and benefits that we saw with Polarian. Roy, I don't know if you're seeing anything different, um, you know, as you guys are integrating grading with Polarian now, or you have been, so feel free to, uh, to also touch on a few of those points. Sure. So um, from the, where we are in the, in the journey with Polarian piece at BD, we have it used in uh, one of our uh, business units. We're, we're leveraging it for its use effectively there. We haven't made it the, the enterprise platform yet, but we're working on uh, some components there, but it does show a lot of value in, in doing that in actually tracing, the, in making your traceability. Um, 
digital, not necessarily automatic. It's still got to you put the logic together, but it actually tracks the yeah. ability to say you have a way, one way to find it versus having to manually create it every time, which is very effective. Oh, yeah. um, there's a lot of downstream integrations that look at whether, you know, when we'll be able to do stuff that it has a lot of value there. I think the biggest piece in this in general, and this is true about player or other uh, di digital, you know, uh, connectivities, is the ability to not have to rely on a person typing in the wrong um, uh, or the right number every single time, right? The traceability matrix that's 400 pages long as in Excel is a god awful mess. The traceability of, hey, I have 400 requirements done by this test script. No, no, you don't. You just documented it that way. The ability to actually verify that it's done, if your requirements are at the atomic level, you know where they are, you can actually trace them and track them and get them the piece of it. That gets a lot of that administrative overhead out of the way. And you can then focus, did I really test what I was supposed to test versus just that I document yeah. everything. Right? But that's one of the key pieces there as well. Um, but I think that's true of any uh, organization that's looking at trying to go from the old um, document-based, paper-based set of requirements to an actual like requirements management solution where you can actually track it at the individual discrete level. Right? Yeah. Now, that logic can be built in multiple ways. Having a tool that does it will facilitate it and make it work, but the concept and the mindset of how do I get my requirements, how am I sure they're traced, how to make sure they work is the key piece that needs to actually, I think, work out for everybody. So. Yep. Yeah, and I'll just add to what you guys went through. Again, uh, one difference, I think, with other tools is this is um, you know, a data-centric tool, right? It is not a document-centric tool as you're looking at, which enables a lot of what you, you both just uh, uh, spoke to. Um, another slide, uh, Frank, that you had put together, if you wanna speak to yep. this, Roy, feel free to add. Yeah, so so we also wanted to be able to show the impact of Polarian, right? How do you sell, because you, know, you, you have to sell this, you do have to put a little bit of effort into you know, integrating into your system, and that's where the compliance group also comes in. They did a fantastic job in, in you know, working with us. Um, but for me, project management and CSV change control was instant gratification with Polarian, right? Going from that file folder with over 900 validation test scripts to having a single dashboard for Polarian, you know, right? You know, if you're somebody that manages a team of validation, uh, you know, members or, you know, throughout multiple business units within an organization, to have one central hub was enormous. It was so nice to have. It was so convenient, right? People asking for updates, where things are at. You can configure things, and it's not that difficult to set up, right? It's not another system that you have to set up and manage and take care of, right? This was easy to use. I didn't want anything hard. Um, and then another Polarian feature that helped me sleep better at night was the digital thread that it creates for documentation requirements. So we validated at the requirement level. So if we were changing something and this requirement was changing, now with the digital thread, we were able to see where did this requirement touch, right? I didn't have to rely on going back through papers or Excel, right? It, it did it automatically. Uh, and I knew I had to retest this, I need to retest this, three, four, five, six, right? Um, before Polarian, we had to be on point with that tracking system. And, you know, we were good, but, you know, with, with auditors coming in, when they see the digital thread system like this, they had no questions. They didn't even dig. They they they, they were more impressed with, with uh, how much we had built into our system and the knowledge, knowing that we were properly testing and doing regression testing. So, you know, most times people would get really scared when the, when the auditors would come in to talk about CSV. I wasn't scared. I was always ready to go and I looked forward to the discussions. They weren't always easy, but I knew I had uh, some great tools and resources to rely on. So, um, Roy, I don't know, you know, how, what other impacts you see with Polarian, you know, throughout BD? Um, I think you covered it pretty well. The, the basic gist of it is having the ability to uh, find evidence quickly uh, yeah. in an audit cannot be understated. Um, having to traverse through nine different uh, or you know or more different uh, repositories of the information is is painful right, at, at best. Um, and there are times when you're just not going to find it. So having 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 actually having a single location to find all the information, regardless of what it is, is, is key to to being able to be audit ready as an example. Right? Yeah. So yeah, you know, one of the best things with Playerian too, just to make a final point, is that you can build that risk into it. And we had a very risk-based decision tree. And 
we were able to set up that logic so people could just do it right within the system. And there were, again, less errors. We were circling things on PowerPoint or uh, uh, flow diagrams before, right? Uh, the system did this all and it could make nice yep. documents. So that was one of my requirements, why I loved Flarian versus other systems that kind of do the similar things. You could really configure it based on risk base for this, this purpose. Yeah, great. I uh, appreciate it, guys. Just checking time. Uh, yep. Maybe we'll wrap up here with some of your lessons learned and advice that, that you want to share of, you know, I think the answer, should we stay or should we go, right, on CSA? I think the answer is we should we should stay, right? We are. <laughs> so, so with that, um, maybe Frank, if you want to take lead on sharing yep. some of these thoughts you put together, and Roy, feel free to, to add. Yeah, and I, th I think we really touched on a lot of these points already throughout the presentation. So not to spend too much time on this, but, you know, push back on those historical misinterpretations, right? You're going to hear, you you still may be hearing things, right? They'll, we can't do this. This is crazy. They're going to look for this, right? Um, and don't let it hamper creating value with improvement and innovation, right? Um, leverage the risk-based approach. Take the risk at the system level, risk at the re requirement level, right? Um, use use the safe space. You know, know that compliance group is here to work with you. The FDA wants to work with you. Notified bodies want to work with you um, on this. So, um, Roy, what do you what are you thinking here? The one thing I would just add um, is the the fact is that the the paradigm shift is is more important than the, the than the than the actual change itself right the mindset of we're going to do this is a bigger thing than 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 it actually is to be honest right leveraging the uh, appropriate approach to a risk based approach to do that and focusing on that is is more of a cultural shift than it is a, a technology or a, or a process shift to be honest that's one of the key pieces i think that's necessary and the the part that i can't think that can't be um uh, understated is truly understanding the impact of the design and the in what a piece of it. Also one thing just to add to the comment that was made earlier is unscripted testing does not mean undocumented testing. Okay. It doesn't mean you just say, oh yeah, I tested it and sign off that I did 50 things and didn't say what I did. What you do is you say, here is the intent of the test, you write down what you need to occur and then you document it and then you can actually show the evidence. You don't have to have step by step piece of it. Another piece to, to rift off of something that was asked, one of the pieces of it is, you know, you can't leverage a vendor's documentation if you never look at it, at least you shouldn't. You can't, you can't say, I'm going to use the out-of-the-box functionality if you never check to see whether the documentation is good. Yeah. Now, if you're using a platform you know that's a vendor that's reputable, awesome, great, right? But if you buy a piece of software for, from Chew, uh, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe.com, you probably have to do a little more testing, Okay. So depending on how it is, you need to look at it. It doesn't mean you have to buy the most expensive package every time. It doesn't mean Correct. the biggest company is necessarily best, but you need to really do the analysis. If you do the analysis, yeah. the rest of it is a lot smoother, a lot easier. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Um, just looking at the slides, see if there's anything else to ask you guys about. Um, why don't we jump into some questions? I mean, we're a little over, but you know, so first I'll, I'll say thank you to both of you. Very much appreciate the time you put in to prepare for this and share uh, your experiences. Uh, I'll come back to, uh, you know, for more information on CSA resources, but, uh, you know, just looking at some of the questions here and, uh, you know, Roy, I think you covered one of them just now, but it was interesting because I think every single webinar uh, I've seen us do related to CSA, we get that question. You know, does uh, unscripted mean undocumented? You know, do I have to document it, right? So you you clarified that, I think. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, another question. I think you I think you alluded to it, but I'll I'll put it out there. Just maybe, Frank, see if you have anything that to add. Um, do we have to do vendor audits in CSA? Again, I, I, you know, I think Roy alluded to it, but I, I'm seeing more and more companies um, trying to, if you will, shortcut things. They, they, they want to back off on all the documentation and not do the audits, right? And I mean, yeah. kind of where Roy was going, you, you, you know, 
it's one or the other. You, you and, can't, and we set up examples on how to how to simply audit the vendor to capture, uh, you know, uh, and give them a risk level of the audit uh, of the vendor. So we could show that in our process of how much we're going to validate the system, right? If they did X, Y, and Z, we gave them this risk level. If they did just X and Y, maybe they were a little bit more risky, and we were going to use a different approach, right? So you do that stuff up front and absolutely know where your vendor stands, and you can utilize that and do less work on your side if you pick the right vendors to work with. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I remember in your process way back, you had – you know that that you know low medium high you know with with the risk oh, and yeah. you know your MES vendor I think was 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 maybe a low risk and then the, another yeah. your ERP vendor was a higher risk and you know that drove right absolutely absolutely so great um, another question here uh, have FDA inspections been held since CSA implementation and how did that go? If so, uh, wondering if investigators have been sufficiently trained on this process. Maybe I'll take the, the second question first, and then, uh, you know, Frank, maybe, you know, have, have you comment, and then Roy on not just FDA, right, but, but even notified bodies. I mean, that's another one. I, I think we see more questions around, right? Hey, it's great the FDA put out the draft guidance, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll go real quick with mine is when, when they opened up our processes and looked at it, this these were outside notified bodies outside the FDA. They didn't even dig. They looked at it and saw we had a nice process set up. They asked for a couple systems. They wanted to see the documents we had, that we had evidence of them. They moved on, right? So uh, there's, there's that ability to show the system without them digging. But I'm sure, Roy, they might have, you know, they, you know, you might have examples of how they dug and Jason, how they look at the, the guidance document that the team wrote as well to help the uh, investigators on, on how to audit this stuff. Yeah. Roy, was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I just, um, my experience with, with uh, auditors from multiple agencies throughout the throughout the last couple of decades has been that they're looking for the most logical approach, not necessarily the most documented approach. If you have a good rationale as to why they did it, they don't usually com complain that much. I mean, every once in a while you get an auditor that's yeah. you know, in a bad mood and, and cause issues with people, but, but I, I rarely have ever seen an auditor that will come in and slam you for an interpretation based on good good analysis, right? I've seen auditors slam companies for not documenting what they did. I've seen uh, auditors come in and slam companies really hard for knowing a problem and just pretending it wasn't there. But I haven't seen any of them that, that said, you had a cogent argument, I disagree with your analysis. That usually does not become a, a, um, a major finding. What does become a major finding is you knew you should have looked at it, never looked at it, or yeah. you didn't even bother checking or you yep. found out it was a problem, but it was too expensive, you didn't fix it. Those are issues. The My interpretation of this analysis based on our assessment of our tool vendor was that this is a low risk and this is what we did. They may disagree with it, you may have to do something else, but they're not gonna come in and you know um, uh, read you the riot act for doing that. If you have a good argument, it's when you, again, if you have it documented well, it then becomes a discussion about the interpretation. If you don't document it at all, or you don't look at it, it becomes, a question of negligence. That's where I think the biggest piece is. Like most auditors are people. They, they, they want to do the right thing. They're trying to get the best value out of the organization. They're trying to make sure that people aren't cheating, but they're also trying to help the people that are trying to do the right thing to do it as effectively as possible. Their goal is not to see everybody as a criminal. Their goal is to make sure that the process is clear, concise, and they can get to the real root cause so they can focus their work on real value versus just, oh, you forgot to check the box in six places. So, yeah, and early on when we were uh, working with the FDA to, to really get CSA out there, again, going back to 2015, 2016, um, anecdotally, right, when this topic would come up with, with in conversations with FDA, they would say, the reason companies get in trouble is exactly what Roy just said. There was no rationale for their risk. There was no documented risk assessment, right, explaining rhyme and reason for what they did or didn't do. Um, and that was the other uh, piece, John Mary, who you know is now retired from FDA, but 
was a really big piece of the, the CSA, the fix the team and really helping getting the, the draft guidance out. I mean, he would always say, you know, you can't say I didn't do anything, right? Tell them what you did and why you did it, right? Take yeah. credit for what you've done, you know, and that's where you'll see it, it, it throughout the draft guidance. That's where yeah. some of that's coming from, right? Um, but yeah, very important. I mean, if you have the rhyme and reason and you can ex explain, you know, I think in the case of Frank, this very um, in-depth decision tree of, you know, how they got to what they did, um, you know, you know, the auditors are like, yep, looks good, right? And, and they move on. So just got to really uh, uh, document uh, that, that thought process. In terms of, you know, have the uh, FDA investigators been sufficiently trained on the process? Uh, you know, that's really one I would defer to the FDA. Uh, I, I do know that there are plans, right, to, of course, do training on this. I don't know what the status of that is, but that is something we can certainly follow up on and ask, you know, in a future FDA uh, webinar to have them touch on what is the status of, of training of the investigators. Um, so I know uh, just looking at the time, we're a little bit past here. I, there were some other questions that came in. Uh, you know, maybe best to have some follow-ups with those folks for those questions at this point. Um, so uh, any last comments, Roy or Frank? Um, I'll go. I, yeah, just uh, like we talked about here, um, there's people out there that will help, uh, you know, frame your process to use the risk, right? When I started this compliance group, we were all learning at the same time. You know, this is years later now. So, uh, you know, if you have a process and you would like, you know, someone to check over for you, right? They're there to help. Uh, they, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. So this is this has been adopted and used in many different places. So there's a lot more examples of success than when we first started this. Um, so, so utilize that, right? And and don't be afraid to to create something and then have it reviewed, right? So that's that's where I'll I'll start with. Great, Roy. Any anything you wanted to add? Uh, I think slightly along the same lines is that um, the whole point behind I think the CSA model and everything else is to to drive more value in the, into the process to get a better outcome for for our patients for our, and for for the people using our products out there. Um, this is not something that I see as a uh, a proprietary thing that I want to keep uh, to myself a piece of it. So if there's an opportunity where people need help or they want to get a, another set of uh, eyes on something that they're trying to do that we've already been successful at, I'm happy to help as well. I mean, the fact is, I'm in this industry because I want to help um, uh, you know move uh, healthcare forward. I'm in this industry because I want to make sure that we do the right thing for our, for um, our um, our customer base and and the patients out there to to advance healthcare. Um, you know, we can have coopetition, right? We can work with each other and help each other as an, as an industry to, to do it better. So, you know, when in doubt, ask. I've had people, I've talked to people at the FDA, they're like, why didn't you come talk to us first? They're like with clients. I'm like, yeah, good question. Why didn't you? You know, let's go see. This is what we're going to do. Does it work? Is it going to work? If you're wrong, but you're doing it with the right reasons, they're going to tell you why you're wrong and go forward. They're not going to slam you for trying. So let's, you know, if there's an issue, let's talk about it. We'll help. We'll help each other. So, yeah, great. Well, thanks again, guys. Very appreciated. And uh, you know, to both comments that Frank and Roy just made, uh, this is a very inclusive group of folks, right? This FDA industry CSA team, right? You can see uh, some really good resources that you can check out. Uh, you know, the Fixa LinkedIn group, MD MDIC. Uh, has a CSA alliance, right, where the FIXA team is partnered with them. And you can see a lot of good resources on the MDIC uh, website as well. Um, we've got lots of uh, on-demand webinars from the last few years. Uh, in particular, um, Roy was talking about how important the culture is. We actually have a great webinar with uh, CGEN, uh, you know, a biopharma company. Um, uh, that we did in early March, where it was all about CSA culture transformation. So again, some really great webinars uh, from a lot of uh, industry thought leaders and manufacturers. So with that, thank you very much. I hope you'll join us in the future for more webinars.
as we make them available. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Frank. Have a great day, everybody.